and I'm going to talk a bit about that. Um, so there is there is potential. Uh, my point is that there is potential then for the J4J to offer something uh, that the labor movement was in search of, uh, i.e., a campaign model that to organize service workers that seem to um, have results. And, uh, and as you know, it, it, the J4J was quite successful, um, not without controversy, I might, I might add, in, in the US, right? The second, the second thing that I think uh, you know, makes this question interesting is, um, is um, um, given neoliberalism's sort of ravaging of uh, workers' lives, um, it doesn't seem to me to matter that uh, the model is specific to the US when neoliberalism you know, crosses borders very easily. Um, not always in the same form, but there's enough consistency, I think, for us to talk about generalities about neoliberalism. Um, and the cleaning industry um, is also, or has been undergoing, sort of the effects of neoliberalism, as you probably know. And I would argue that perhaps uh, building cleaners have been the ones who have sort of endured uh, some of the worst sort of aspects of neoliberalism, you know, contracting out, uh, privatization, um, being laid off, and then uh, you know forced to back to work, uh, rehire at uh, lower wage rates, um, you know, intensification of domestic work as a result of of uh, precariousness of formal work uh, in the cleaning workplace, and so on. So. Um, and in addition to that, uh, even though um, even though the industry is primarily a kind of um, mom and pop operation, you know, so primarily it's a ten employees or less that work in these workplaces, there are nevertheless huge players in the cleaning industry, and these use, these players, as you probably know, um, operate in different markets. So they're not just specific to one market; they operate in, in a number of them. So I'm thinking. You know, in particular, the ISS Danish company that uh, has um, operations and cleaners uh, across the world. Um, I tried. I tried to sort of conceptualize uh, cleaners as a kind of experience of a sweatshop citizenship. Now, I, I don't mean sweatshop in the sense of the grungy sort of a super exploited, you know, uh, worker in a dingy, dingy kind of basement. Uh, you know. Uh, hunched over a sewing machine and, and, and I don't want to claim you know that experience I think you know that's that's a, a, you know, it's, it's an awful experience and I, I hope that borrowing sweatshop citizenship is, does not in any way diminish that kind of experience and that's not my intent but my intent was that it was that um, uh, building cleaners um, are in a kind of a crux between you know a, a social impact industrial impact and citizenship issues, right? So for you know, they're being sort of they're being sort of um, screwed over in their workplace, right? As I just mentioned earlier. In addition to that, as most workers are, they're feeling the impact of a restructuring welfare state, right? That provides less and less um, for workers, or when it does, it does in a very sort of uh, aggressive manner. Um, and and many of them are are new citizens, or some of them aren't officially citizens, and so that sort of plays into it. So, sweatshop citizen citizenship is a concept that I, I try to sort of argue encapsulates these kind of experiences. Now, um, I, I as I mentioned to you, I've been studying cleaners for a number of years, and, and, and primarily I started off. Toronto and Vancouver, um, and then and then I decided that the, the, with the rise of the Justice for Janitors, it'd be interesting to follow it, right? And as you can see, there are a number of uh, there are a number of ways that labor has transnationalized, right? And those are some, and, and I think you know, Natalie will speak about uh, other ways and, and and so on. So there are there, there, there are different ways, right? Um, so what, what was interesting about my research was, and I think this different from most, at least, at least when I began the research, was that uh, I was interested in a union that was globalizing and a union that brought along with its globalizing a model. Um, you know, it didn't, 
I mean, there was a kind of a pull, a push and a pull factor as well, right? There's, you know, from the other side, there were also unions very much interested in, in what was happening and, and the, the success of what seemingly was a, was a model that was, was uh, successful. And, and so that union was the, C, the uh, uh, SEIU, and I don't have to go into the background of the SEIU, as you know, it's, uh, again, it's, uh, it's a controversial union, to put it mildly. But it was interesting in that um, it, it sought to organize and to take a lead in organizing across uh, borders. And it did that for, in, in a, couple of, a couple of ways, right? One, it argued that um, unions in the past um, uh, had pretty much been involved in a kind of um, tourist junkets to other locations, you know, there were a period of visiting other locations, but nothing really, uh, um, no legacy of these visits were actually sort of taken away, right? These are kind of, um, I, I mean, I haven't really investigated that, but that's their point. The second one was that they, in 2004 in particular, they put forth a seven-step um, seven plan, and one of them uh, to grow the union, to expand the union, and so on, and one of them was global strength, to build global strength through partnerships with unions uh, elsewhere. And, uh, and, and it, this, this, these partnerships were, uh, were a way to establish, or try to establish, structures that state, that took shape and, 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 and mechanisms in place to reproduce these structures over time. Okay. And one of them is the, this idea of institutional internationalism, which kind of captures this idea of, uh, of cross-border organizing and these partnerships and, 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 and how there was, an, there, there was a, a um, there's a means to create the framework to sustain these cross-border organizing uh, approaches. Um, and so, in terms of partnerships, right? And I have a, the whole discussion about partnerships, which I think is, which I think is an interesting kind of concept for a union to use, because to me, partnership seems more like a corporate concept. You know, unions talk about solidarity, collaboration, and so on. But the SEIU um, um, put for the idea of partnerships. Um, so, it, you know, and I have a discussion about that in the paper, if anybody wants to, so is interested, uh, um, which basically, you know, makes some of the arguments that I just, or makes some of the points that I just uh, made, uh, and, and in some cases, partnerships are always disadvantaged that less a partner, right, and, and I think that's an issue. But in this, this table just gives you sort of an idea of the global expansion of the SEIU through its partnership with unions elsewhere. And I focus mainly on um, Australia, Holland, and Ireland. I, did, I visited Mexico uh, and interviewed people, you know, the, the key people there, and and France, where there was a there was a flirtation with uh, one of the unions in France, and uh, where one of the SEIU officials uh, spent a year shattering one of the officials to see the extent to which they would wanted to partner with the SEIU um, in terms of transforming union structures as well as, as implementing a kind of um, justice for janitors. Um, so, um, so you can see there, there, there are advocates of, of, um, of these partnership in each, in each location or the three of the locations and that was important. Uh, but as you'll see in the next slide, there was um, there's some hes you know, there's some hesitancy. There's uh, some people who weren't quite um, weren't quite. For example, the FNV Botenhagen in uh, in Holland uh, was very lukewarm to the advances of the SEIU, um, and in fact, shepherd um, shepherd um, the. Um, the ideas into a pilot project to see whether or not it was successful. Now I followed that po that pilot project, and you know, and it wasn't successful. But the uh, FNB Votenhagen uh, has transformed itself. So anyway, but what I wanted to point out here is um, is that again, going back to the idea of the justice for janitors and that kind of model, and I was interested to what extent. Uh, 
to what extent does it, you know, how does it land where it lands? You know, I've tried to, to, to sort of ascertain or, 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 or flush out where it landed, but I was also interested in, you know, why it landed there. And so that, um, that uh, initially the campaign was about mobilizing people, not just to be union members, but also to be community activists so, and, you know, and enlarge, enhance the campaign to reach out into issues beyond the workplace. In, 2000, in 2015, that had all been reused through staff, changing leadership, and, um, and, um, and relocation. And I, I'll just read you briefly what uh, Pat said. As Pat said, well, Pat was, this is from field notes I had, and I'll quickly read it. It says, we met at a coffee shop in the street over from Liberty Hall. We discussed the cleaning campaign and changes since my first visit. According to this interview, things had changed significantly since the departure of the person who first oversaw the campaign. This leader moved to a higher position in the union. When this happened, the creative force was gone, as were many of the initiatives developed for the cleaning campaign. The Cleaners Forum, or cleaners from various locations in Dublin, came together to discuss issues they faced in the workplace was gone. The uh, was it had been established. In addition, they took the platform to share ideas on what to do about their issues. The Cleaners Forum is gone now, and this is a huge loss since the voices, opinions, and insights of cleaners are no longer part of the ongoing cleaners cam organizing campaign. Perhaps more importantly is the politics of solidarity, the forum provider whereby cleaners from different locations came together and shared stories, met one another, and made common cause. More importantly, the original campaign had a politics of conscious raising and a kind of insurgency attack, attached to the world and the people involved. So this is no longer the case. Right? So, um, so where does that leave me? Right, and I'll just have uh, 30 seconds, one minute. Um, first, um, first, the assessment of the cleaning campaign. Uh, you know, I think, I think for me, out at the outset, to, um, to, to try sort of, you know, convey to myself that the model can be applied everywhere the same way is unrealistic. And the local matters, and the local is significant. Uh, unfortunately, there are uh, a lot of contingencies in the local that, um, that uh, constrain organizing. And whereas in some cases, in, with these campaigns, people told me that there was no time limit in terms of results, quotation marks, uh, um, that wasn't really the case. You know, there are still sort of quotas to be met. And if uh, campaigns don't, re don't provide results, Resources get shifted, people get moved around. And stuff. So in that, in that way, um, there's a kind of a dampened mood about the cleaning campaign. And I fear what will happen to cleaners, given that in, um, in the places across the board that I um, interview, resources have been shifted out of.